Hello listeners, it's Adrian here from Arcade Attack and today I'm joined by Michael Daly, the Lemons and GTA legend. Please sit back and enjoy a great interview with a real retro gaming legend. Welcome to Arcade Attack. A retro gaming podcast for up to four players. Hello, listeners. Welcome to the latest Arcade Attack podcast. I've got another amazing guest today, the Lemons, the GTA legend himself, Michael Daly. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. No worries. Brilliant. Uh, can I start, actually, when uh, you, kind of your earliest memories and fondest memories of video games uh, growing up? What, what were your favourite games back then? Um, let me see. Initially, I think the first stuff was, I saw was... Um, an arcade machine, um, Galaxians or something. Um, but after that, a friend got a, a ZX81. Um, we used to play some crappy games on there. But it was really when the Spectrum, when he got a Spectrum and we started playing things like Manic Miner and um, Full Throttle and all that kind of stuff, Death Chase, um, was when you kind of started getting hooked on it. Uh, they were the ones that really, spec of games, the variety of them was great. And that's what kind of hooked us. Brilliant. Um, how how did you first get the opportunity to get into the gaming industry? What did you do it at college or at university or what was the big opportunity? No. Um. So back in about eighty five, um, I was I had a, a Commodore Plus four, and uh, a friend from school told me to go and um along to this computer club that he'd heard about. Um, uh, on the the Kingsway in one of the colleges here, and so I took along. You had to take along everything basically. So I took along my Commodore Plus Four and my portable monitor in this huge hold all. Um, took out the bus, went away around there. It was a fair distance away, um, and then met up with uh, Steve Hammond, Russell K, Dave Jones. They were at this club as well. Um, most of the club was basically copying games as you did back then. <laughs> but uh, these guys were kind of like myself, were a lot more interested in making things. Um, I took along a couple of demos. I think I had a, a kind of scrolly, dreadnoughty type spaceship or something at, at one of them. Um, and that kind of drew interest. Um, so Steve, Steve was on the, the 64 at that point. Um, Dave had just got his Amiga but he was still doing Spectrum stuff with Russell. Um, so we we all kind of got together and, and basically started to make little demos and things together. Uh, Russell and Dave finishing off a game called Moonshadow mm. on Spectrum. Dave actually grew bored of that and went on to his Amiga and left Russell to, to finish it off. Um, but, you know, we did lots of little game and no names, as we called them, which were just games we started off and never went anywhere. Um, and then Dave started to get into his Amiga programming a lot more while he was at uni and um, basically that's what uh, Menace came out of mm. um, I'd I'd been I think I was just finishing school at that point, I was going to go into college so once he finished Menace he started doing another game called Blood Money um, on the Amiga and Menace did okay, I think it sold about 20,000 copies enough to, to buy him a little car and he decided that he, he quite fancied doing you know starting up an office um, I'd just been kicked out of college uh, around <laughs> Christmas time for not going basically um, the courses back then were all kind of sysadmin things just they weren't particularly useful mm-hmm. so no great shakes um, but my mother obviously wasn't particularly happy um, but I think three months after that um, Dave asked if I wanted to, if, if he started an office, would I want a job? So, I mean, that was a pretty easy interview and a pretty easy answer, you know, uh, get into your kind of dream job doing games. So he took, he got me a, a Dolphin DOS for my Commodore 64, which was a kind of turbo loading thing, mm. the disk drive. 
and I I did this shoot 'em up demo, um, and he gave that to Psygnosis as as proof that I could code, and he got um, for my first game um, Ballistics, he got that as a port from the Amiga NST, and I had to take that onto the Commodore 64. So we kind of started oh, probably about May or so um, in Russell Kay's house. We were up in his bedroom. Um, doing these ports. Uh, he was doing Menace at that point. I put Menace to the PC and I was porting Ballistics over uh, to the Commodore 64. Um, and we were there for about three months until Dave got an office sorted out. And we all moved out of the office. So it was a, an interesting start, but you know, it, was, it was fairly straightforward as far as I was concerned. You don't get interviews quite that easy. Do you want a job? Yes, no. thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you obviously earned your job but i suppose you knew the people as well were these correct me if i'm wrong uh, michael these were the original you, you and yourself included the founders of dma design is that right yeah the four of us were kind of the ones that started out back in 85 or, or so and we were, we were all making games together and then when dave started up uh, i mean it was his money he he started the office and then i was the first employee um russell and steve were freelance for a while and then came into the company later. Brilliant. What does DMA stand for, if you don't want me to ask him? doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right, fair enough. <laughs> That's a very good answer. Um, what was it like the early days? Because he said earlier, just then you worked in bedrooms. Obviously, it got, I assume, a bit more professional it, when you moved to an office. What, how do you reflect on sort of really early days and sort of finding your feet and, and building a name for yourself? Um, I mean... It, it didn't actually change that much when we went to the office um, because it was still just the four of us initially. Um, it was still very much a boys club. Um, so much so that when Dave's girlfriend came down to the office, um, she would go into a cleaning frenzy because the state of the bathroom in the office was horrendous. Um, and because we were, you know, teenagers and early 20 somethings, we didn't even think of that. So in the early days, it was, it was very chilled. Um, and it still didn't feel totally real when you get down to it. I don't think it did until I saw the first my first game on a shelf in a shop. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, it, it took a good few years till other folks started coming into the office before it started getting a little bit more. You know, we're a proper development studio uh, now. So Gary Timmins appeared a month after me. Um, Dave employed him to do art, and I mean, had other folks. Scott Johnson um, came as well. He was he was to do art for Walker. Um, who else came in the early days? We had lots of devs floating in and out as well. We kind of became a hub, yeah, uh, because there wasn't many places in Scotland for coders. So I think there was one in Glasgow as well, and they'd come through now and again. Um, just for chats and drinks and stuff. So it was, early days was very, yeah, still very bedroom codery. Nah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, you've all, even you know for a good number of years, DMA Design they work very closely with uh, Signosis. How did that opportunity and that relationship sort of arrive? And uh, it just seemed that that you guys seem to work very well together. Would you agree with that? And how would you sort of reflect back on that sort of relationship? In the early days, I think that's true. I mean. It was obviously Dave with his Menace game that, that chose Psygnosis. He, um, he initially took the demo around various places, and uh, I think Houston were the first ones to actually show interest. And actually, there was a it was published on the front of a magazine under the, the Houston Houston name because it was going to be Zynaps. Mm-hmm. Um, but doing a port of a game, you obviously don't get nearly as much money. So Dave decided to keep looking. And I think he said that Psygnosis was more or less the closest one. You could drive down and they were interested. So I think it was about a three and a half to four hour drive from Dundee to Liverpool. Mm. Um, well, in those days. Uh, it's a bit longer now because the speed cameras that he used to floor it. <laughs> I think we did it in three and a half hours from Dundee, which is it was quite good going in those days. Yeah. Um, so it, it was really, yeah. I mean, Psygnosis was just getting going. Um, but they were the closest ones to to us, really, and you could drive there. 
this stuff. I actually I spoke to uh, Mike Clark recently, and he worked for Signosis, yeah. and he he said that sometimes he would help out your games and just test them. Uh, did you ever do any work on any of uh, their games by any chance? Ever cross crossover at all, or do you, you kept your own stuff really? Well, with, I did a couple of port. I mean, we did a few ports in uh, DMA. I did Ballistics and Shadow of the Beast. Yeah. We did a C64 port, Shadow of the Beast as well. Um, I think after that. It, it was just all our own stuff because the Lemmings had appeared by then. But up until oh, that yes. point, yeah, it was the, those those two games we ported to PC Engine and, and C64. It must have been pretty hard to get Shadow of the Beast on the C64. Do you, how, how would you reflect on that sort of particular that, that role? I, I didn't do that port. I did the PC Engine one. Oh, sorry. I, okay, yeah. I helped, I helped roughly on the 64 one just to, to give technical suggestions um, on how to do things. Um, it was actually done by uh, Richard Swinfin, who was a friend of mine at the time. Um, it was the 64 one was interesting because it started out as disc and then went to cartridge, um, just because of the size of it. Yeah. Um, but you know, the 64 is kind of suited to smooth scrolling, so it was okay. Uh, there was just the usual challenges of, of fitting a game that size in, um, but wasn't too bad the um pc engine port was more complicated we started out doing just a straight port of it um but then the contract with nec they we weren't particularly happy with that they wanted a lot more added to it like psygnosis had been promising them the earth to, to get them to sign up um so it ended up going from just a cartridge to the cd-rom uh, system and the cd-rom stuff was a nightmare um, you didn't have directories or anything when you built the disk system. You actually you had this huge um, double bay SCSI drive. That was a 720 meg drive, which back then when you had like a 20 meg drive, that was what your you know machine had. These were huge things, mm. um, and it basically built this direct index accessing thing. So it was a bit of a pain to to build and get running. Um, and we ended up doing a big full motion. Uh, video player for it as well to oh, wow. um, to actually get you know the the intro sequences as you go from uh, one level to another you get this bit of video playing as well so it, it it was complicated and it actually took a couple of years to do which when you're used to doing games in six months was a long time yeah um, especially with support as well that's quite yeah, a long time isn't it very long time it, it became known as the game from hell <laughs> uh, just would not die yeah are you a fan of the original because obviously the amiga version is a top of the range isn't it it's it's visually stunning what, well what i remember you... when we first saw it um and it was i mean it's basically it's a tech demo turned into a game mm. but the playability on it was awful yes um but the the visuals on it were very pretty um and yeah i mean the first time in Eddington brought it up to show us it was yeah you kind of jaws hit the ground a little bit it looked like an arcade machine uh, which was very cool. I, I actually agree. It looks amazing. It doesn't play quite as good as it looks, truthfully. Yeah. Um, I've got to ask now, Lemons. I mean, you are probably best known for two gaming series, and we'll talk about the the second one soon. But Lemons, wow. <laughs> it's. I mean, how did that first start? How did it? You first sort of think we're going to make a puzzle game, and uh, you know we can make it with like small sprites. I would love to know the kind of early development ideas thrown about, and how you sort of stumbled across. It's an amazing game. So the initial part of it was the, the characters, obviously. Mm. Um, and that came about because of uh, an argument between Scott Johnson and myself. Um, Scott had been brought in, as I said earlier, to, to do graphics for Walker. Mm. Uh, Walker was the character out of Blood Money, the, the two-legged attack that Dave really liked and wanted to do a game with. So Scott came in to do graphics for that. He did this, the initial... Um, Atat Sprite and then set about doing characters for the the, the walker to shoot um, yeah. but they were all about 16 by 16 pixels high so they were they were large um, and I thought overly large um, you think of Star Wars and it's Atat you know people barely can pass the feet really yes. um, whereas on the Amiga that would bring them up almost to the height of the cockpit so it would make the Atat seem very small so I had this discussion with them saying that um, this should be much smaller. Eight by eight would probably be good. Mm. He didn't think you could get any kind of character in that. 
So I set about doing this animation to try and prove them wrong. Um, I think the animation's out there somewhere. Um, you can see from it that I did it mostly, I think it ended up being about 10 pixels with these bouncy hair, um, or spiky hair as I, I drew them. Um, so, but it was, it was a lot slimmer and smaller um, and kind of fitted the bill much better. But when I was doing it, um, and I took inspiration for the character from a couple of games. Um, one was Beachhead 2 on the 64. They had a really nice animation sequence um, of a guy throwing things. Like I remembered it a lot smaller than it actually was. But then the other one was Oids that had, you know, tiny four or five mm. high characters who didn't animate well. But, you know, as soon as you, you make them a little bit bigger, you think, well, that should probably work better. Um, so after seeing that and, and drawing some of these lemmings, um, I decided to kind of draw a gun, shooting one and having it burn down the way that um, Oids did when you shot them on the ground. Um, and did I do that? And then no, I think I did that one first. I had the gun and the little burning down animation and I showed that to the guys um, and they were all just kind of falling about laughing at it. Just this stack of wee men running up to a gun to be shot. Mm. Um, it was there that Russell kind of just coined that phrase, you know, they, they just look like lemmings walking up <laughs> and, and falling off that. that kind of stuff. Ah. Um, and just say, you know, there's, there's definitely a game in that somewhere. Um, after that, I drew a tent on weight squashing them. And then Gary Timmons did um, a couple of other death sequences, either the mouth and a, a spinny blade. But he also took my original character and, and smoothed it out and made it a lot more bouncy. Um, so once they had that, it was really just who could find the time to do the demo first. Um, Russell managed to get them walking on the ground first. He had an idea from watching Salamander uh, when you fire missiles and they, they come along and they hit the ground and they follow the train. He had this idea about using that for lemming walking. So he, he did a demo with all the lemmings characters dropping on, walking on the ground using this technique. And he got he got the hundred on on an eight megahertz PC, which was a lot of characters back then. So that was the first demo, and that was shown to a few folk. We actually went down to the PCW game in remember it being September or October of eighty nine. So the office had only been open a couple of months, mm. um, and we all kind of flew down to London. Um, to go to this computer show. And they showed it around and everybody's going, yeah, yeah, nothing, no huge amounts of interest in it um, as yet. And so I think that the, I managed to do a very brief demo of just allowing walking as well on the 64, but then I got pulled on to something else. I think I was way to start Shadow of the Beast at that point. Um, and then it was actually Dave that then found the time. He, he, he was working on Walker, but it wasn't going the way he wanted. So he, mm. he shelved it and decided to, to have a go at Lemmings instead. Um, and it was actually Dave and Gary that came up with the skills and um, general gameplay of it all um, and the mechanics of just, you know, digging through the ground and all that kind of stuff. Um, he did it in a very simple way, just a huge bitmap and had all the characters walking over, just like Russell's demo. Um, and then just came up with ways of letting them modify the ground which is obviously putting something down taking something away um and then giving that as tools over to us to actually try and make levels with um the traps themselves came from the very original demo when i did the animation we did all these ways of killing lemmings um it was obvious that when you did a game the whole thing would have to revolve around them dying in some way Mm -hmm. So the, the traps were really an obvious thing to put in to say, you know, we can get all these comic deaths. Um, it was very much Wile the Coyote Roadrunner style. Just, you know, the most more ludicrous you can think, think of, the better. <laughs> Which is where the 10 ton weight came from. You know, it was, it was brilliant. Classic, the Coyote stuff. Um, so he put in all these objects and got Gary to animate them all. Scott drew all the backgrounds. Um, and then he gave us this wonderful level editor to basically play and see what kind of levels we could come up with. Um, and from that, it was really just, we just sat and, and made levels and tried to beat each other 
with these levels. Uh, so it took a wee while, but you know, bit of practice, and we were ending up making you know, incredibly difficult levels that everybody else could solve almost instantly because they were so good at the game by that point. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, you can't obviously release games with impossibly difficult levels to start with. So it did occur that if you just added a couple of skills or something to the levels we already had, you would make them a lot easier. So that, that's why you've got the duplicate levels uh, through the game, just ah. to see it's making, you know, huge numbers of them. Mm. You just take the original level that was hard, we add a couple of skills, make it much easier, and then Gary went through and graded the whole thing, basically, to make that nice difficulty curve. And he also, Gary did the, um, basically those introductionary levels, you know, just dig and so on, mm. just to get people into it. And they're really important because it introduces everybody to each individual skill so you can see what it does without any complication in it. Um, and then you start getting all the combos and stuff and, and really eases you into the whole game. Um, it's probably one of the first tutorials that you kind of got in computer games is just this slow introduction of things. Um, so, I mean, it, it was quite a slow build from that initial thing all the way through. I mean, that would have been 89 and then the game obviously came out in 91. So it took about nine months, I think, to actually do the game. So there was a good six or seven months where, you know, somebody would do something and stop and go into something else and then come back until Dave actually sat down and, and and started making it in all earnestly, basically. So. It's a great game, and it was a bit different for me at the time. It stood out. It, I think the small sprite stood out. I mean, did you know from not day one possibly, but quite early on in development, it, it was pretty special. This game could be really quite important in the industry. No, you, you, you never do. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter what game you're doing, you, you're so isolated in your own little view of it that you have no idea how other people will take it. I mean, we've done other games before that just didn't do anything that we thought were great. Um, I mean, it's the same in any industry. You know, People making movies and stuff um, will think their movie's the best thing. Won't go anywhere. People making games. I mean, you see all these games go out there. And they just won't go anywhere. It's I think Dave says when he took the first few demos of the level down to Psygnosis to show them, and he left the demo desk and went out for lunch with Ian. Then when he came back, it was on every single machine in the office. <laughs> and he says that's when he realised that it could be something special. Yeah. But us in the office, it wasn't really until we started seeing magazine reviews and people talking about it that we actually really got a good idea of you know, what it was going to do. It's a good answer. I've got to ask, actually, out of, um, uh, you mentioned earlier about the saying, you know, the lemons famously throw themselves off cliffs. It's a perfect perfect character. Did you even for a split second or any of your team think about other characters, other animals, or make them humans, or was it always lemons from day one? Uh, As soon as Russell said that they're like lemons, the first Mm. time I showed them it, that name just stuck, because it just fits it perfectly. Um, No one ever thought about changing the name. As far as I'm aware, certainly not in Dundee. I don't know if Psygnosis did, but to us, it just fit perfectly. You know, these guys just walk along and then fall off the end of a cliff. It was just, it was perfect. It was per- I've got to ask a random question. Have you ever ever seen a real lemon in real life, an actual lemon? A uh, stuffed one at a museum. <laughs> oh, bless. Oh, we, don't, we don't want to know how that lemon died, sadly. We never know, I don't think. But <laughs> do you have a favourite kind of, it's a bit of, a, bit of a morbid question, but a favourite lemon death, a kind of funny uh, death scene? Oh, everybody's got to go with the explosion, surely. <laughs> oh, oh, I have to say, it, it sounds terrible, but sometimes if I knew I wasn't going to win the level, I would just press the detonate oh, yeah. button. Yeah. And, I, it, <laughs> and it, just watching oh, the amount of sprites, it was um, sadly, <laughs> quite morbidly quite satisfying, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it, it's strange because it, it, it fulfilled two needs, basically. One is you had to quit the level and start again. And the other one was just this, release of frustration um it just fulfilled it perfectly and i mean it just came about because dave loved the defender explosion when you shot something about these big explosions yeah. um and he just loved that so it was scott johnson did a, a particle system in basic to generate this animation um and then it's just this little point cloud sprite that gets drawn so but it works great it's just that release of frustrations is brilliant <laughs> How about the the pause menu, uh, the option? I quite thought that was quite clever. Who who came up with that idea? 
Um, I'm not sure, but I have to say for us, it seems quite natural. I've got a feeling it's been on other things before Lemmings. Oh, fair enough. Um, but I'm not quite sure where from. But it was quite natural for us, I think. I get it's just a great example, another example of that game. Just being the, the, the humour of the game was perfect, I have to say. Mm. Uh, was there a particular level that you helped design uh, that you think, wow, this this is a brilliant level. It's got everything I want in it, and it, you, you look back and go, that's probably the best lemons level I've made. It could be could be for any lemons game. Uh, the the original one, the it's Hero Time, mm. um, is definitely my favourite. Um, normally, when we sent when uh, we, when we made levels. We send them that diagnosis, they test them, and we get some feedback on it saying it's too hard, it's too easy, it's yeah. you know, it took us this length of time to do. And there'd, there'd be a few notes for each level that we sent down. When we sent that one down, there were scribbles all over the page. Um, normally it'd take them about three to five minutes to fi- finish a level. This one took them over an hour. Wow. And just scribbles everywhere. And it's just one of those levels that needs that slight um you know, lateral thinking to actually solve that I was really quite proud of it it's definitely one of my favorites uh, again I, I don't think I've got this in my questions but do you are you quite I, what I like about the game is you can complete the, the same level in different ways can't you yeah some, and is it quite have you ever seen people play levels differently than you expected and have you seen quite ingenious things go on um in earlier levels you can certainly do that later levels tend to be you, know, you tend to have to do them in the, the specific way. When we were testing it, um, if somebody did it a different way, we'd go and change it to make sure ah. it had to get it done in our way. Um, the original, one of the things that Dave loved about Lemmings, and actually is what got him into all the GTA stuff as well, is this kind of just give them the tools and give them an open world and, and just let them figure it out. So the tools can just be used in any way. Um, and it seems like it's very liberating and, and quite free to make them and and use them and you could do a level anyhow but actually like i say early on when you had spares of skills then yeah you could probably do it slightly differently but as soon as you got to the original design of that level they were all pretty strict in terms of what you'd have to get and where you'd use things yeah because we spent a long time making sure that there was no other pass through because a lot of the time when Steve Hammond was doing levels, a lot of his levels failed because there were these other paths. And he'd come up with this really difficult path through, but there'd be a really easy one to go around. <laughs> um, and that was the trick. I mean, Dave only got a couple of levels in for the same reason. It was Scott, Dave, uh, Gary and I that, that kind of did the, the main bulk of the levels um, because we were able to narrow down exactly the path that we wanted people to take. Ah. No, good. I mean, I always thought, and you, it's pretty, you've probably already answered it, that Lemons could have a really good kind of um, map editor. You can make your own levels and, <laughs> and challenge your friends. But I guess, I don't think that ever happened, did it? Is that fair? No, I mean, there's there's obviously level editors out there now for it. Um, back then, the built-in level editor, there's, there's actually a video of it up on my YouTube now. Oh. Um, but back then, we did consider releasing it. And the level editor that was built into the game was really nice to use. Um, but Psygnosis just reckoned would make more money selling more levels rather than doing a level uh, editor. And also, you couldn't really share levels very easily back then, so it'd be a bit pointless a lot of the time. Um, so they just decided, no, we won't do a level editor, we'll just do more levels. <laughs> you, you had the Christmas uh, editions and so forth, didn't you? And oh, no more lemons. Yeah, I know that makes sense. Yeah. Definitely. I've got to ask you, actually, Mike, about the infamous 666 level on Lemons. I mean, yeah. you, that was one of yours, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I mean, is that the hardest level in the game? I mean, can you explain exactly oh, no, how, no. How, that come, how did that come about exactly? It's not very hard at all. It was just a, a visual concept more than anything else. Um, in the level editor, you could set the release rates, the number of lemons you had and all this kind of stuff, and it would give you a percentage at the end that you had to save and so on. I was trying to make 55 of everything, um, but releasing 55, whatever it was, Lemmings, I couldn't get the 55% to quite match up. Yep. Um, I just discovered by accident, I've made it 66, all the percentages and everything just worked out, so I could do 66 of everything. Um, I happened to be doing designing the level because there was the different styles, and I just so happened I was in the fire and brimstone style. And you just think, fire and blimps from 666, oh, 666. No, <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, 
And that's that's the only reason it came about. Um, and we got serious stick for it. Oh, really? The US kind of, you know, deep south, they were not happy with a 666 in a game, mm. um, saying promoting Satanism and all that kind of stuff. Although I do tend to think you're dropped in it and you're rescuing them from it and taking them to a better place. That's that's my theory. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. Was there any other kind of funny levels like that or, you know, interesting sort of ideas that maybe didn't make it into the game? Any other kind of weird, you know, level ideas, for example? Not for me, really. I mean, the 666 one obviously got in, but was dropped from, I think, every other port of the game. Um, like the the Nintendo ones and stuff, they they all dropped that and, and put in a substitute level. But all the other ones went over um, as is, and there was very little not taken. I had I've got one or two on my editor disc that didn't make the cut, but if they didn't make the cuts because they weren't particularly good, right. rather than there's just no space for it. We used all the levels that were good, basically. Fair enough. How about um, abilities? I mean, obviously, some can sort of build bridges. There's umbrellas, obviously. Uh, there's diggers. I mean, you, you, there's so many very interesting abilities. Was there any original, for the original title, I mean, abilities that were discussed that never quite made it into the game? No, I mean, when we first, when we saw it, I mean, it was it was mostly those skills that were in. I don't ever remember other ones um, really kind of coming and then going. It was always just the ones that were there. Um, they kind of fill the gap pretty well. I think the only things that we thought were missing were some kind of vertical uh, climbing thing. You've obviously got the, the builders that go diagonally, but you can have diggers that go straight down or miners that go diagonally. So there was no vertical build, but that was just part of the mechanic, just couldn't do that at the time. So the ones that were there were always the ones that were there. There was nothing, there was never any really added, and then we thought, no, we'll take them out. Um, they they just fit really well, I have to say. Uh, David enough. Gary did a great job with those skills. They're just no, they yeah. perfect for it. No, I agree. I think it's the perfect amount. How about, um, I don't know if you know anything about this, actually. There was a, Apparently, there was an arcade version of Lemons in the Works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But well, it was cancelled, and apparently there's a trackball. What what exactly, can you tell the story about that, Michael? Um, I don't know how it came about. I mean, it would have just been Psygnosis and Data East. I actually have an arcade board here with it. I rescued wow. it from DMA when it um, <laughs> died. Um, you can actually play it on main. I managed to get the ROMs off it. I don't know if they exist anywhere else. That's so amazing. the Data East guy was apparently a huge Lemmings fan, and apparently whenever you had a meeting with him, he would challenge you to a two-player Lemmings. Um, so he was just a huge fan of it. So they they um, commissioned an arcade one. Um, it got... I think that you can play the different levels. There was lots of bugs in it. Um, but it was, yeah, it was going to be trackball, because obviously you play it with a mouse rather than yeah. a joystick. Uh, so we did have one in the office, um, which is the, the board I've got. I didn't actually rescue the trackballs. Um, but, you know, it was there. It was buggy. Like I so say, you, you can probably find it for MAME. Mm. Um, Data East did it. And, you know, it, it looked like Lemmings. It was also the thing that they gave us the idea for the fast forward, because they implemented the fast forward for Lemmings 1. Uh, oh, that's clever then, yeah. Yeah, and we thought, that's a good idea. So then we pinched it for Lemmings 2. <laughs> Because <laughs> it was the thing that really annoys you in Lemmings 1, waiting for all your Lemmings to finish. Yeah. Um, and fast forward. Yeah, makes total sense. So we pinched that. There you go. There you go. I mean, I bet those arcade machines are worth a pretty penny, uh, if there's any knocking about still. Well, I don't think it was. They never got as far as an arcade machine. Right, it was okay. Just a, a, a board. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, how about Lemmings 2 then, the tribes? Were you involved in that game quite a lot as well? Um, I did the SNES version of it. Right. So, um, I mean, that was, again, Dave and Gary um, and some of the other artists and stuff, I guess, uh, sat down and came up with all of the skills. Um, obviously, coming from uh, just that limited set, you wanted a whole load of new ones. Um, mm. So there was, there was a few driving forces behind Lemmings 2. One is we wanted to get rid of the, the technology that was in Lemmings 1, which was just this huge bitmap. Because going onto console, it was a nightmare. You just didn't have the RAM for it. Mm. So... Dave came up with a tile map system that he figured out would kind of work and then sat with me and we kind of went through it and made sure it would. So I was obviously going to do it on the SNES, so I had to. Um, and that, that was the kind of main driving force 
as far as the technology went, is to make sure it was actually portable into everything. Um, but in doing so, you also got a chance to change the orientation of the levels. So Lemmings 1 was obviously just horizontal. Lemmings 2, you, there were several different sizes of map from horizontal to vertical. Yeah. And I think that was the best addition in Lemmings 2 was just that change in orientation because it really changed how levels progressed and how you, you moved through them. It was totally different. Um, the skills, again, like I say, was just they came up with a load of skills, but some of them are rubbish. We ended up having to go back through levels and put in um, skills that were never used. So things like the roller and stuff were just they were pointless. Yeah. They were never used. So they put them into some levels just so they were used. Uh, some of the other skills are very cool. Things like the Magna Booter was a really cool skill, but again, yeah. it was a pointless one. Things like the Ballooner were really nice and actually took a bit of skill um, to actually use, so they were really good ones. Uh, the Archer was a great skill, but the code was horrendous. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I would have taken maybe 10 or 20 skills, I think, rather than the huge numbers that, that we ended up with. Um, yeah. You could have easily done a nice set of uh, levels just with those ones. Um, the tribes themselves, I think that was really the biggest problem with Lamings is that progression. People got stuck on a level, and that was just that, you know, you got hit that frustration point. The tribes let you have basically 12 save points. So when you got frustrated with one, you could skip to another tribe and play that one. So it kept you in the game longer. Yeah. Um, so that was just a really nice mechanism for keeping you non-frustrated, basically. So it was quite good fun. I mean, the, the SNES one, I said I did most, most of the SNES work. Um, it was challenging, um, but it looks very pretty. You could play with the mouse. It was great. Um, I was, the SNES is a nice machine to work on. So. God, I love the SNES. Is it true, actually, while, while I'm talking about the SNES, that... I think it's the first lemons, or what are lemons too, actually? You can use the super scope to shoot lemons, is that right? Yeah, uh, you, you plug the super scope into the second port, you can use the super scope to blow them up. <laughs> is uh, that the second lemons then, lemons too? The second lemons, yeah. Lemons Brilliant. Two. Was that your idea to add that in? Just little... Yeah, um, I borrowed the super scope from Russell Key's company um, just because I had that a wacky idea for a, a hidden feature, um, <laughs> and nobody ever found it. Oh, really? Yeah, I, um, I think I put it out on, it was, um, who was it? The Armin Animation guys, they were doing a talk and they asked me about it. So they did a video again, it's up on YouTube, um, of them plugging in the Super Scope and playing Lemmings 2. Um, nobody ever found it, which surprised me, I have to say. Yeah. I have to put you on the spot now, Mark. Is there any other sneaky Easter eggs you've added? Any any other games that you can reveal or have you <laughs> keeping um, your lips sealed? No, I think that Shadow of the Beast had a, an Infinite Lives thing, oh. um, but that was just on the buttons and, and most people found it. It was really easy. I think you just did one, two, two, one on the fire button and you got infinite lives um, on the title screen. Yeah. Um, Blood money, you typed in we missed because we missed the deadline and that gave you a cheat <laughs> mode, the infinite lives on that one. Um, what are the games? I think that's it, really. It's like a bit picky after that. So, yeah. Ah, fair enough. Um. Here's another bit of a wacky question, but if you could be like a master of any of the skills in any of the Lemons games, you mentioned a few there for Lemons 2, which skill would you love to have personally and why? Oh, it's got to go Super Lemon, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, of course. That's the obvious answer. <laughs> what would be the most pointless power, do you think? Pointless power. Well, you get your roller and your um, runners and stuff. Yeah, it was, the roller was stupid. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got here that Lemons uh, was one of the most ported games of all time. It's on so many different systems and consoles and whatnot. And it's made, I've got here over 15 million sales. You may have a different figure, but would you personally class your, your work on Lemons as probably your biggest achievement in the industry? I mean, not many people can say they've worked on such an important game, in my, in my personal opinion. Um. Most folk would probably class GTA as that, but I'm still a Lemmings boy. Yeah. I still, I still favour Lemmings over GTA. I think it's got a, it's got more potential for for my liking. It's just never been taken. Um, but I think the 
the characters, the humour, it's just, I think it's a much more enjoyable game than GTA. So, yeah. yeah. We'll talk about GTA very soon. How about, again, as we're kind of the Lemons theme, uh, Lemons 3, all new world of Lemons. I mean, that's a bit of a different take on the game. What, what's your personal opinion on, on that game? The first, Kind of the Lemons 3 it's been sort of dubbed. Yeah, um, I did a little bit on Lemons 3. I did some of the audio stuff for them, and I did the installer, I seem to remember, as well. Um, but it was, I mean, it was really just rounding out the contract with Psygnosis. Mm. Uh, Psygnosis had contracted for six games that was the last one so it was really just a case of get another game done and get it out the door uh, Lemmings 3 the big characters really spoiled it for me uh, yeah. that came about because um, they got contacted by uh, the children's television workshop so Sesame Street um, mm. who were really interested in using Lemmings to count because obviously there's a lot of them and you could probably count them uh, and they like doing that. So they thought having lemmings on screen walking past and counting them would be quite cool. Um, but they needed them bigger for TV. So Dave decided, we'll do lemmings today, we'll make them bigger, then they could use it in the TV. So they came up with this mechanism for doing it. And then all this stuff fell through and we're stuck with this game with big lemmings. It didn't really work properly. Um, you lost that instantaneousness of clicking and something happening. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the biggest problem with Lemmings 3 just big characters they feel slow and sluggish because you click and then it's got to wait for an animation sequence before it yeah it just didn't work properly but I was never a big fan no fair enough how about um the future of Lemmings I mean there's been some mobile games recently uh, Would where would you like to see the series taken in the future and would you ever love to get back on the Lemmings hot seat um I mean, I've, I've seen videos of the, the, the iPhone one, but I've never played it. It's got the same problem as Lemmings 3. Um, they're all, you know, you do stuff on a block and stuff, and I, I don't like that. Um, I think I th- it would be nice to see Lemmings just not regurgitating the same old gameplay, because that's all they're doing just now. It's the same game over and over again. The thing that I liked about Lemmings is the characters were so... You know, versatile. You could use them in just about anything. Um, I think the tribes probably showed that more than anything else. It's just, you know, you could dress them up, you could do anything with them. Mm. Um, and I would have liked to see a lot more, like, different game types just using the lemmings. Do a platformer, do funny shooters. I know Russell's company did um, lemmings paintball. And yes. more of that, just different directions with the characters, like Mario's done, I think is what they need to do. But they've just, you know, same game, same game, same game. Oh, this is boring. Uh, how about oh, let's let's go to GTA now, if that's all right, Michael. I mean, again, that's an um, unbelievable game. I guess I'm assuming you would never, you know, you would never think that the game then, what you're working on, would become the sort of juggernaut it is now. I mean, yeah. was I mean, it's absolutely incredible, isn't it? It really is. But when you were first making GTA, GTA, sorry, I think it was called Race and Chase. Is it true that it was originally sort of developed for the Amiga? No. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it was never even considered for the Amiga. So mm. GTA came about, let's see, so it would have been 94, I'd finished my, my SNES work. So I'd finished doing Lemmings 2, and I was doing, I'd just finished doing Uniracer stuff as well. Um, and I was kind of left on my own devices to play with stuff. So uh, I was playing with some technology ideas. Um, I'd never done an isometric game. So I decided to basically see what, how we do an isometric game on a, on a PC. That was my current platform. Um, so I built this basic isometric thing, standard isometric. You build a level, you walk through it. Um, I thought, okay, that's very good, but everybody's obviously done that. So what can you do to make it a bit more interesting? So I decided to basically see if I could spin the isometric view uh, smoothly rather than just that forced 90 degree thing. Um, so I managed to get that working um, and basically had this kind of city, little mini city view, um, spinning about in an isometric view, which was quite interesting. So I showed Dave and he thought, you know, you could probably use it for some kind of game engine. So he gave it to Keith, who just finished Lemmings 3. He was the guy that led the Lemmings 3 team. Yeah. Um, and him and, um, what's his name, Watson, Graham Watson? No. 
oh, I can't remember the guy's name now. Somebody watching it. He, the designer guy, he came up with basically a game design that was about gangs fighting each other um, using this engine. And it's actually really what, Lemmings, uh, what GTA 2 kind of turned into, funnily enough. But for this one, they set out trying to build, rebuild this engine, but they're trying to do it in high res. Uh, Keith wasn't especially good at assembler, so it was all in C, so it was just sluggish. And they just couldn't quite get it working at the pace they needed it to. Um, but while they were doing that, um, I would, I'd carried on with my kind of tech ideas. Um, and I'd seen Clockwork Night on the Sega Saturn, because we had a Saturn machine in the office. Yeah, yeah. I was sitting watching it. And I loved this kind of parallax platform, you know, perspective platform that they had. Um, so I thought, well, could I do that on the PC? Um, so I managed to reproduce that perspective, you know, platform that he jumps on. Um, and then realized that, you know, what if I took the GTA, that isometric thing, which was basically just a big stack of points in this kind of cute world that I spun. What if I did that and actually put perspective on it so that, you know, it could be side on and you could have all these platforms moving in this kind of perspective cube world. Yes. Um, I got that up and running and then showed um, John White, who was, uh, they were they were starting to work on the um, N64 stuff. Um, and he'd said that they'd been trying to get a racing game past Dave for ages, but he just wasn't particularly interested. Uh, Dave's a bit card nut, but just racing games are always the same thing. Um, this promised to be a little bit different from normal racing games. Racing games in general was that first person view, kind of, you know, driving a car in a third person thing, whatever. Um, so I suddenly realized if I put a wall in this uh, side on platformer uh, that I had, but actually painted roads on it, then all of a sudden it goes from the side on thing to top down just by putting roads on the wall. Yeah. Um, and so all of a sudden you've got this little mini kind of top down city that you can kind of scroll about and you get this lovely perspective out of it. Uh, so this was late 94 um, that I was doing this. So this would have been on, still on a 46 at this point. Um, so I showed Dave. So Dave um, was there with a guy, David Osborne, who was the, one of the head artists. Uh, Keith was there. And we kind of showed them what I could do and, and how it worked. And if you remember back, I was saying that Dave likes this idea of a sandbox, you know, like Lemmings. You give them tools and a world to play in and just let them go at it and put things in it. And he kind of realized pretty quickly that given a city that you've got decent kind of uh, constraints around, so you can make it appear quite busy, that you can make, you know, this kind of living city, and then you could just drop players into it and let them, you know, do things. And so he decided, okay, we'll scrap the other one, um, which turned out to be a good idea because um, about a year later, Syndicate Wars came out and yeah. we, kind of, we didn't like the viewpoint at all. And that was more or less that isometric rotating thing. So we were quite pleased we dropped that. But Keith took the engine, read it on C, um, and then they started to do this game that Ga David thought of, which is this Cops and Robbers. So you could play either the Cops or the robbers, excuse me. Um, and the idea being that if you're the cops, you would chase after the robbers. If you're the robbers, you avoid the cops and commit crimes and so on. Um, so it took a while for them to kind of get things going, particularly because they, they couldn't get the car physics right for a long time. Mm. Um, and then Pat Kerr, who was working on a game called Wild Metal Country, um, he basically just went, look, here's Here's a car physics of it, and uh, they, they kind of dropped this one in. It was just very nice to use. And at that point, they got this kind of driving through the streets of this big city. Um, there was nothing else there. It was just this one car driving through. There was corruption all over the place, but you got this feel of speed and a car going through the, um, the city. And it's kind of that point, you go, yeah, this feels nice. Mm. This could be quite cool. Um, and then they start to put the city into life and just, you know, I had pedestrians, I had more cars, all this kind of stuff. Um, GTA has always been kind of slated for its very basic retro graphics, um, which in some regards true, but at the same time, 
the game would never have worked in a third person or first person um, viewpoint, particularly back then. Yeah. You think you're starting the game in 95, 96 is where it's supposed to be finished. You know, you'd still be software rendering, really. Um, you couldn't have drawn a city with any kind of view distance in third person and have populated it at the same time. You look back at games like Carmageddon and stuff that have, um, you know, were about that time. Yeah. They've got like two people walking about and another car. There's nothing there. Whereas GTA, because of that top down view and sprites, you know, it, it's busy. There's lots moving oh, yeah. about. Um, oh, yeah. And that's what really makes the game. And most people tend to miss that, is that it's the fact that it's a living city is why you have so much fun in there. And if it had been in 3D, it would never have been like that. So I think the the whole thing about, you know, giving this top down view where you could zoom out and see more of the city, the, the engine just kind of lended itself to that. Um, and it let you confine it to just that view to be able to fill it with interesting things. You can put in lots of pedestrians, you could put um, other cars in it, you could put police, ambulance, all the trains and stuff, and they were very easily culled out without having to try and draw huge amounts all the time. Um, so it kind of progressed, um, as most games do. Um, it went through lots of design issues, most of which I'm not particularly privy to because I was up. I was doing tech on it. Um, I took over the rendering of it from Keith. Um, I ended up giving them this little library that would release down again with a new rendering engine. Um, I rewrote all the stuff in Assembler. Um, and then we got a, we were ready to get a visit from 3D Effects. And we suddenly realized we had nothing to show them. They'd given us a card about a year or so earlier. Um, but we didn't actually have many any 3D games at that point. So it was a case of, well, what did we show them? Um, because I've been doing this library, I managed to knock up um, a version of the GTA library with 3D effects in it, which meant we could have a nice high-res filtered thing, um, which was really nice. Um, so we kind of showed them that. And went, oh, look, we're using the cards. Thank you for sending us free stuff. And <laughs> it was all very good. But it played so well, and you got such a smooth frame rate and everything out, that we couldn't bring it about to, to throw it away. It was just done as a, a khaki test, but it was too good to throw away, so we ended up having to maintain it and then releasing it, but it was never paid for by anybody. It was just a demo that was too good to bin. Uh, I've, I've heard reports that it was close to being cancelled at some point. Is that true, or is it... You, you said oh. here you just couldn't cancel it. Is that right? Hello? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mike, yeah. Uh, sorry, you probably broke up there. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> we'll cut that bit out. Yeah, uh, Mike, I just want to ask if um, it was ever close to being cancelled or is it always going to be made? Um, I think that the people in the production part, so because I was on the tech, the, you obviously had the producers and stuff that were talking to BMG uh, and they, they kept saying that it's, you know, um, it, they wanted to cut it all the time. They yeah. had to fight for it, you know, almost every week to stop it from being cut. Um, I was never in those meetings, but you talk to like say Gary Penn or Dave, and they've gone, yeah, every every other week they, they, they were talking about cancelling it. So it did have a a rocky birth. <laughs> when it was yeah. when it was released, it caused quite a bit of controversy, didn't it, in the media and I uh, just. I've heard even reports here. Again, you can say this is a load of rubbish, but I've got here some reports that the infamous uh, publicist Matt Clifford actually planted a few stories about the game that could either maybe help sell the game or bring it to the media attention. What, what do you think about that? What are your views about the controversy about the game? Well, David always said that he, he had a meeting with Max Clifford and, and he laid out this PR campaign and told them all the different things were going to happen, all this controversy and stuff, and yeah. that every single one happened. So, I mean, Max was obviously this media guru yeah. and what he was doing. So you can only assume that, yeah, there was there was things planted to cause controversy. I mean, how else would you get a game like that um, being discussed in the House of Lords? It was just it's crazy. <laughs> it's you mad, know, they're talking it? about murder simulators. There was nothing like that. You know, there was much worse games going about. Um, so it was it was. I put all the media success right down to Max Clifford. 
Mm. He knew what he was doing and he, he, he did it well. No, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Um, were you surprised, actually? Uh, I mean, look, let's be honest. The first Grand Theft Auto was not... Uh, no, dud. It sold millions, didn't it? But are you even shocked to today how massive the series has become? Arguably the biggest game series in the world right now. Yeah, I think... I mean, PS2 had a lot to, to, to say about that, really. Um, I think the, the guys from Silicon Valley that did the game Silicon Valley at DMA... Uh, Les Benjies and, and Adam and, and stuff and Ober, they were the ones that really took it from basically what's an arcade game. You look at GTA 1 and GTA 2, they're yeah. still fundamentally arcade games, because uh, that's what DMA kind of did. And they're the ones that took it from that into this kind of cinema style storytelling. Um, and I think that's what took it to the mass market, coupled with the PS2 becoming that kind of really cool must-have thing. Um, I think the, the two kind of needed each other to really make the success out of it. So GTA became the game you had to have on a PS2, but everybody had to have a PS2 because it was just this cool, desirable thing. Um, so one made the other, I, I suspect. Yeah. Um, and then once they were starting to play it, you know, GTA 3, Vice City and so on, and it just got bigger and bigger. And from that, it was just, yeah, it was just obviously it was just going to take off. I don't think you could ever have guessed it was going to be as big as it is, but certainly back in you know early 2000 or something, uh, after GTA 2 and Vice City, you could kind of see it's it's starting to grow its momentum. Yeah. Um, but I put that again down to to Les and the guys that just they just took it in a totally different direction from the original game. The original core game's still there because that's what's still fun. You know, stealing cars and going about and stuff. That's still the core mechanic. Um, but taking it away from that fundamental arcade experience and making it that 3D story film thing is, is yeah. really what kind of attracted the masses, I think. Um, and again, you look at the early PS2 version of GTA 3 and there's still not a lot walking about. They were definitely kind of cutting the edge in terms of making a living city at that point. It was... No, it was hit or miss whether people would fall for it, really, because there wasn't a lot of going on at that point. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, once folk kind of, yeah, okay, we'll forgive that, then it, it yeah, it just kind of took off with the kind of storyline stuff. Ah, fair enough. And obviously, DMA Design, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, they, it turned into Rockstar North. Is that right? And were you there at the time, or when when did you leave no, uh, the I company? Left, I left just before GTA 2 right. uh, finished. Um, I'd done the graphic engine for GTA 2, um, and I left to go uh, and be hard, head of R and D at Russell Kay's Visual Sciences Company. Yeah. Um, so I kind of saw it from afar, really. Um, but I know that the guys in Dundee were, were treated badly by Rockstar. Really? Uh, they just as they moved everybody to Edinburgh. Right, that's a shame. Uh, obviously, Rockstar North is still a massive Scottish uh, yeah. video, but it sounds, it does sound not quite the same. Some people say it's like the DMA design uh, of the future, but you wouldn't quite agree with you. It's not really. Yeah, no, it's very big in corporate. So. Very big in corporate. I mean, it's, I mean, GTA is one of the biggest exports in, from Scotland, apparently. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's incredible, yeah. isn't it really? Yeah. When you think, of, when you see the new games, do you see it as a completely new entity or do you still sort of, you must still feel proud that you're part of the original. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still an evolution of the original yeah. game. Um, like I say, the, the core mechanic of what it all does is still in there, um, and that still drives the whole game. So, you know, it's 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 like any of these kind of big franchises. You look at the original Mario you know, from Donkey Kong. It's you know, <laughs> it's started from that and going on. But you know, when you have a hand in the original, you still feel quite proud of, of it. No, of course you should. Uh, are you looking forward to the new GTA 6? I mean, there's rumblings it's being produced, and which direction do you think they should go in? Do you, do you think it's just going to keep going the way it is, or are you a fan of the current sort of series? Um, I haven't played GTA 5 at all. Mm. Um, I, th- I, had, I did get 4 just to run about and then see what the engine was like, but most of the games, I mean, GTA 3 and 4, I don't know about 5, but I, I hate this kind of blocking off of content where you just want to drive about because that's oh, yeah. that's the fun bit. 
In yes. Vice City, all I did was steal a car, drive about, <laughs> steal a fire engine, do a lot of missions. I, I have no interest in these big long stories. I just don't have the time for it. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I don't really care about the newer games. Um. They're just kind of yeah, they're kind of for younger generations that have the time to waste. <laughs> I actually when I when I was playing GTA growing up I'll be honest Mike I didn't do the missions I no. just like to drive around and, and get yeah. the police after me and I I never really did the missions it was but that was part of the fun and I didn't feel guilty about it well know? that's what I'm saying about being an arcade game it's just that yeah. immediate kind of fun of getting do this cause mayhem and then if you died okay that, that will start again you didn't really care that much and that's the core mechanic of it and that's still yeah. kind of there um but the later games kind of block it off a little bit yeah. Um, I think GTA 3 is a bit more, uh, GTA 5 is more open. Um, it's just this kind of bigger open world rather than, you know, GTA 4, the HUD whole city is blocked off, like, you know, barriers and stuff. And that was just horrible. Oh. Uh, but I think it's certainly more open now. So to some respect, it's, it's kind of getting back to its original route of just letting people play. Um, my son plays it. He, I mean, they go and have mad fun and doing stunts and stuff all over the place. Again, <laughs> they don't play the missions. They play about in it. Yeah. And which is what the original game was. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I've got a few sort of random last last few questions. I know yep. you're a busy man, Michael. But if you could work on any sort of sequel to any DMA design title, ones you've worked on, ones you've sort of only had a few a few things involved in, what would you love to do? Any particular title you'd love to make a sequel in? Um, I'd love to do another Blood Money, I have to say. Blood Money. Oh, yes. Shoot of an Amiga. That was great fun. Um, always thought a, a 3D side on one of that would be lovely. Um, Uniracers is again it's, it's one of these games that because of the Pixar lawsuit you just can't yeah. do but it was, a, it was a fun game um, yeah no, probably Blood Money I have to say Blood Money was good fun yeah yeah good good answer yeah. how about how about a Walker I mean I, I don't know if you heard but Mike Clark was actually working on a PS3 Walker game do you reckon, <laughs> there's, do you reckon there's room for any Walker game anything where you shoot masses of little people yeah that's fine yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you ever start working on any video games that were never completed, never released? And if so, what which of those titles do you think would have actually been quite successful? Uh, yeah, loads. Oh, really? In, in games, you, you, you start lots of stuff that is never finished. Yeah. Um, there's a few of them that I hope to resurrect at some point. So we'll keep quiet about those. There's, there's certainly some, even when we're growing up before The Office, that I'd still quite like to go back and, and try and play with at some point because there were some good ideas in there. So yeah, there was there was there was a good few. Um, I think Gore could still be quite good. That was a basically a golden axe style thing with huge characters. Yeah. Um, I think that could be good. It's kind of mission genre these days. That kind of wandering through, just hacking things. Oh yes. Kind of died to death, but they were always good fun. So yeah, the the, the good few. Maybe I'll get round to doing them at some point stuff um what are your three favorite games of all time a really tough question mm. um super mario world the yeah. one that came with the snes um i spent a year playing that constantly so i finished it and got 100 percent on it wow um the monkey island series oh yes personal uh, favorite because they're just phenomenally good um then it gets tougher um we probably get the more modern ones. I suspect the earlier Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed 2 is probably my favourite. Right. Um, the early Call of Duty ones were good too, but um, yeah, the Assassin's Creed 2. Assassin's Creed 1 was the pretty, prettier one, but Assassin's Creed 2 had better game mechanics in it uh, for combat. It was just much easier. Mm. So probably Assassin's Creed 2. Yeah, I suspect so. So, yeah, those three. Yeah, good choices. Are you still actually in the gaming industry then? And if so, what projects are you currently working on? Or is it all quite hush-hush? Yeah, I'm, I've got my own little company now. that I'm just me on my own, just doing little um, indie-style games. Um, I have an IP I'm working on that yeah, I can't say anything about at the moment. <laughs> uh, probably won't be too long until it's out. Um, but it's, yeah, just trying to do something that's a bit more educational but not educational games more games that are educational um because educational games are shit so uh, <laughs> we want to do something that basically feels like a game that you happen to be learning in without you knowing um i think that's 
that would be nice to try and achieve. Yeah. Um, I think this, kids spend so much time in games. If you could just turn the tables on them a little bit uh, and get them to learn something when they're in there, that would be nice. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Um, <clears throat> it's been a great chat, Mike. I've really enjoyed having to you today. I've got one sort of final sort of wacky question. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could go for a few drinks with any video game character <laughs> in the world of any video game, who would you choose and why? Yeah, it's a tough one, that. Um, it would probably either be the Leisure Suit Larry guy, because he'd have some hell of a story, oh, yes, um, he would. or the Blue Shift security guy, because he desperately needs a drink. <laughs> one of those. They both need drinks for different reasons, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Michael, thank you so much. It's been a great a great chat, and um, yeah, I really appreciate your time today. No worries. It's been fun. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch regarding this week's episode or anything else, you can tweet us at Arcade Attack UK, at Keith Barlow82, and at Arcade underscore Adriano. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash 